very much. So I think uh, maybe Mike has already spoken a little bit about uh, moments of L functions. And so I'll uh, uh, skip through some of the history, but then I'll still try to motivate what the problems are and what we're interested in and give uh, at least some of the results which, uh, which are related to this problem. There's been a lot of activity on this question in the last uh, 15 years or so, and we've seen a lot of progress. Uh, so the main question is to understand the uh, moments in Is that possible? Yeah. So we'd like to understand, so for zeta, you might want to understand something like uh, the integral from 0 to t of some power of the zeta function on the half line. And k could be some, uh, let's say, natural number or some real number, which is positive. And, uh, or you could try to understand the related question for families of L functions, so for example, for the sum of L half uh, chi to the 2k, where you range over all primitive characters chi mod q, or similar things where you range over other families of uh, L functions. So for example, you can range over fundamental discriminants up to some point, and you can average Dirichlet L functions to some power, these are all expected to be positive, so I don't have to take absolute value to the k, if you like. Or another related thing would be to understand the sum of L half, uh, pick your favorite modular form, and twist it by Dirichlet characters. And uh, one of the reasons why we are interested in questions of this type is that we would like to understand, maybe concurrently with this problem, is to understand the distribution of values of these L functions. Well, on or uh, on the half line or at half. And uh, I mean, of course, the two problems are related, but uh, the moments here will grow so rapidly that they will not really give you a nice distribution of these values. But I'll explain what we know in this context. And also, we do know something about the distribution of values, but it doesn't completely answer questions about the moments. Maybe to start with, let me explain why we focus on the half line. You could, uh, you could study these kinds of questions on other lines as well. Uh, the problem is easier on any line except for the half line, and the half line is the hardest. So, uh, okay, easier doesn't mean that uh, we really know the answer, but at least, uh, at least conjecturally we know, we understand everything about moments to the right of the half line. Let me give you a particular case where we can make a lot of progress, which also has some arithmetical significance, which is if you want to understand distribution of values of, say, L1 chi d, where d is some fundamental discriminant. And this is kind of typical of what happens if you're not on the half line. Well, this is quite easy in some ways. I can just write this as a series of chi d n over n. And, uh, and then I can think of modeling these, uh, these Legendre symbols chi dn by random variables which take values 0 plus minus 1. And uh, they're not entirely independent random variables because the function chi dn is multiplicative. So I should really make some model which is a uh, model of independent random variables on the primes and then multiply them all together on all the integers. So I can model this by... by looking at, uh, at, say, something like this, random variables which take value 1 with probability 1 over twice p plus 1. Probability p roughly half, so p over twice p plus 1, minus 1 with probability p over twice p plus 1. 
and zero with probability one over p plus one. Because every once in a while it happens that your discriminant is actually reducible by the prime, but you have to put in this condition. And, and then so you take uh, on the primes random variables defined like so, and then if, uh, if n is a product of primes p to the alpha, you just put uh, xn to be the product of xp to the alpha. And this gives you some perfectly nice, uh, uh, I mean, this sum of independent random, sum of random variables will actually converge. One way to see that it will converge almost surely is that if you look at its uh, variance, it'll be roughly bounded by something like 1 over n squared, which converges. And then you can understand what the distribution of the random model is, and you can ask how well does the distribution of actual L1 chi d mimic what happens in the random case. And uh, a lot of people have studied questions of this type. Uh, and the fit is very good for quite a long ways. So, so the kind of results you could prove here would be that, uh, say, the probability of finding L1 chi d being bigger than some uh, e to the gamma times tau, let's say. So gamma is Euler's constant. This is something like So this is not a Gaussian or any kind of nice distribution. It's something which decreases extremely rapidly. It decreases doubly exponentially. And similarly, you can prove something about what the probability of getting very small values of L1 chi d are. Okay? And the upshot of this is that if you like, L1 chi d is essentially always bounded below by a tenth and bounded above by 10. And it's very unlikely that you're going to see anything which is different from this. Okay, it's not obviously not true, but, but okay. So, and you can use this to say something about uh, class numbers, for example, but it, the information that you get will be very weak. So, so here's a, a question that I like, and which uh, I don't really have a good idea of what the answer should be, and there's not, so far as I can see, much numerical evidence one way or the other. So I throw it out as something which maybe people can explore. If you just look at uh, imaginary quadratic fields, and you can count is the number of fields with class number H. Right? So for example, F1 is 9. And, uh, it's not really a, such a you know, problem to deal, deal with the Ziegel zero because the, the Ziegel zero would just say you can either determine f of h up to an error of one. That's okay. I would just like to understand what are the asymptotics of f of h. Um, and I, I don't really have a good idea of what, uh, what the answer should be. I mean, the obvious guess that you can make is that f of h should be about size h. So roughly speaking, on scale of h. And the reason for this is that, as I said, all these L values are usually of constant size. So that if you want to find class numbers of size h, you have to go only for discriminants up to h squared. Then the class numbers would all be of size, you know, anything between h over 2 and 2h, let's say. So if each number appears equally often, then you would expect that there are about h fields. With, with a given class number. You have to take into account some features like if the discriminant is not a prime, then the class number will be divisible by two. So most likely your class numbers are going to be even. So if h is odd, you might expect that there are only h over log h such, uh, such fields, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, the only thing that I can prove based on this is something uh, uh, very silly. I can only prove something like this is bounded by h squared divided by log h or something like that. That's the, that's the only thing I know about this. But that has a, that has a, a consequence. It proves that uh, the class numbers are not all uh, are not okay. I, I, So power of two 
time some b, and let's say b is an odd number less than 100. Or, sorry. So, <laughs> so, you know, not all class numbers are powers of t, or powers of 2 times some bounded number. In fact, most of them are not of this form. But if you ask, can all class numbers be of the form 2 to the a times 3 to the b times uh, c, where c is some number less than 100, then the answer, you know, I don't know how to prove anything about this. So, so, so you can, even in this case where we kind of understand a lot about the distribution of values of L functions, if you ask very fine questions about things like class numbers, the problem is that you're not only interested in understanding what this distribution looks like, but in a very, very tiny interval, you're asking how many times can some L value land in such a tiny interval, and those problems get extremely hard. So now, okay, so maybe this was meant to say that the problem gets easier when you're away from the half line, so maybe I haven't quite communicated that. But anyway, so at least as far as distribution goes on some course level, you can understand what happens on any line sigma bigger than half. And the reason for this is that, for example, if I want to look at L sigma chi d, I can once again try to approximate this by the sum of xn over n to the sigma. And once again, model this by, by so, and this will converge almost surely. Whereas on the other hand, if I look at xn divided by square root of n, then it will almost surely not converge. And so I can't hope to say anything uh, about zeta of half plus it or L half chi by, by these techniques. Another way of saying what I've just said is that the distribution of L functions to the right of the half line is like that of uh, the, the structure is that of an almost periodic function in some sense, and uh, on the half line there is no almost periodic structure. So, so for zeta, it's a it's a classical problem which goes back to Hardy and Littlewood to try to understand something about the two kth moments of, of zeta, and the, there are only still. There are still only two situations where we understand this. There's an old result of Hardy and Littlewood, which calculates the second moment. And then there's a result of Ingham, which calculates the fourth moment. So this uh, I can write as 2 times 1 over 4 pi squared times t log t to the fourth. And then for all other, for all other values, this, it's an open problem to determine any kind of asymptotics. And in fact, for a long time, it was not even clear what the conjecture should be. But you might have heard from Mike's talk that this is something which changed about uh, a dozen years back. And now we have pretty good conjectures, at least on what the distribution should be. So, so there's a conjecture which uh, is that the 2kth moment should look like some constant gk times ak times t log t to the, to the k squared. And this constant ak is something which was uh, well understood. So maybe the easiest way to say what that constant is is that if you look at the sum of the k divisor function squared over n, then that's asymptotic to a k times log t to the k squared. So it was always suspected that, and I'll explain this uh, a little bit later, that something like this should appear in the asymptotics for the 2 kth moment. So this is something which we understand very well. This constant gk was not well understood. g1 was 1, g2 is 2. and uh, in the early 90s, uh, Connery and Ghosh conjectured that G3 was 42, and Connery and Gonick conjectured that G4 was 24,024. And then in 98, uh, Keating and Snaith had a general conjecture for what GK should be. This is quite nice for integers. It's something like k squared factorial times a product of uh, j factorial over k plus j factorial.
sorry. Isn't this, uh, well, you mean here you want uh, a K squared. Okay, but I didn't say what AK was. Right? Say, so, okay, but it's your, it's your AK, so maybe I should put. Well, if I had it to say, I was fine. Okay. All right. So, so this makes AK look like an Euler product. Okay, so, but again, you know, we, in fact, they actually give a conjecture for all real values of k, or maybe even complex values of k in some range, but, uh, but that's just, uh, the formula will look a little bit different here. And they also gave a conjecture for uh, for moments in families. So for example, for in the symplectic case of all of uh, quadratic Dirichlet functions, there's a conjecture which says that if you look at the kth moment, you get something of size, some constant. Okay, now I'm not gonna spell out what this is because uh, but the exponent on the power of log is different. It's uh, k times k plus one over two instead of uh, instead of k squared. And if you look at quadratic twists of a modular form, then you get something like another constant dk, let's say, x log x to the k times k minus one over two. Okay, so, so again, these conjectures are more precise. There's an actual value for ck and dk, which is specified. And then later work has also shown that you can actually give a, you can write down a polynomial, as a, an asymptotic expansion for these moments with all these lower order terms also identified, which is due to uh, Connery, Farmer, Keating, Rubinstein, and Snape. So at least conjecturally now, we have a pretty good understanding of what these moments look like. And we also have some results towards these conjectures, which I'll Now try to explain. So there are three kinds of results that we know. So one is uh, is lower bounds. Now the theory here is now I think. Uh, I think we now completely understand lower bounds and we can basically prove unconditionally lower bounds of the right order of magnitude in most interesting cases. In, well, let's, let me say in many cases. So, so, at least in the T aspect for things like the zeta function and you know, the integral of zeta of half plus it or any automorphic form in, in L, L half plus it, you can actually prove lower bounds of the right order of magnitude. But if you, if you are trying to understand the lower bounds of families of, for families of L functions at a given point, you'd better make sure that your family does not identically vanish at half. So you must have some control to start with on these values at half. And essentially what we can say is that if you understand the first moment, so you know that a lot of them are not zero, you, can, you have some control over a little bit more than the first moment, then you have lower bounds of the right order of magnitude. So I'll explain uh, this. There's a lot of people who worked on this, but the, the method which works most generally for L functions is due to Rudnick and me from a few years back. Uh, and we also have now upper bounds, it would be very nice to have unconditional upper bounds, which would be the Lindelof hypothesis. The Lindelof hypothesis is simply the statement that the 
the, the, the values of these L functions are bounded by the conductor to the epsilon. So in particular, the values of these moments are bounded by t to the 1 plus epsilon or x to the 1 plus epsilon. Of course, we don't have that. But you can assume, so you, you have to assume Rh or GRh. And once you do that, then we have upper bounds of the right order of magnitude. Uh, actually, not exactly the right order of magnitude, apart now from a power of log to the epsilon. So, so for example, for the zeta function, just to write down one accurate result, this is now known to be less than less than uh, t log t to the k squared plus epsilon. Okay. So this is on Rh. And unconditionally, it's always bigger than some constant times t log t to the k squared. So it's, we're still far from the conjecture, but at least the right order of magnitude should not be in doubt. And And then there's lastly work on, uh, on small values of k, where we have asymptotics in various, uh, in various examples. So maybe if I have time, I'll kind of give uh, one recent example where Matt Young and I were able to prove the asymptotic for uh, quadratic twists of uh, the initially quadratic twist of a, of a modular form, but assuming GRH. Okay, so let me uh, explain these three uh, kinds of results. And uh, I also hope to show, in explaining these results, why the moment uh, asymptotics have the kind of shape that they do, why you get this power of log. So, let me start with uh, lower bounds. So for zeta, the idea of proving lower bounds for these moments goes uh, uh, quite a long ways back to Tichmarsh, who proved some kind of weighted lower bounds in general. Now, then there was a lot of study on it by, by Ramachandra and uh, Heath Brown and Connery and Ghosh through the 80s. Uh, and the, the basic idea is quite, uh, is quite nice. So, so you look at, uh, so suppose you're interested in moments up to high t, and you look at this function uh, m to the i t, uh, where m goes up, where m is some natural number. So, so this is some function, and t goes from 0 to t. And what you can see is that these functions are approximately orthogonal. For small values of m. You just integrate out. So if you take two functions, m to the it and n to the it, then you compute what m over n to the it is. And you can see that this is big. So this is about size uh, t if m is uh, equal to m, and then it's very small if m is not equal to m by just computing what the, what the integral is. Now, of course, at some point of time, your luck will run out because if m is n plus 1 and n is very large, bigger than t, then you can't really tell the difference between n and n plus 1. It's a simple. What you're using is that this uh, function is oscillating, and so it'll cancel out if you integrate over a big region. But if m and n plus m and n are very close to each other, uh, then it may not oscillate when m and n are bigger than t. So, so that... So that tells you how you can get uh, how you can get lower bounds. You have some list of functions which are approximately orthogonal to each other. So if you can compute the inner product of the zeta function to the k with these functions, then you can use Bessel's inequality. 
So you can compute uh, zeta of half plus it to the k times uh, m to the it, let's say, dt. And then this should be something of size uh, t times uh, the k divisor function dk of m, m over square root of m. Okay, so if you so you know just pretend that I can evaluate, I can write this as dk of m over n to the half plus it, and then just use the fact that you have this orthogonality. And then once you once you have this, then you have a lower bound for the for the two k moment. It's at least as large as t times the sum of dkm. Which is uh, which is a lower bound of the right order of magnitude at least. Okay, so there are some things that I have sloughed over. This is something you can justify for integer values of k. You can work harder and justify it for rational values of k as well. It doesn't quite work for irrational values of k, but okay. But at least you're, you know, you're not so far away. And the main thing here is to compute this correlation. So, so this sum of uh, overall m could be a long sum. n could be very large, but if you assume that m is small and you compute this integral, you only need to know that one of m or n is small in order to get cancellation in this interval. Because your, your worst case situation is when m and n are close to each other. And if m is small and n is going to be close to m, then n is also going to be small. So if one of them is big and the other is small, it doesn't hurt you. But if you try to generalize this argument for, say, Dirichlet L functions, you run into a problem. If you, if you want to get lower bounds for, say, L half chi to the, to the 2k, you can again set it up the same way. You can look at values of your character chi of m. They will be approximately orthogonal for small values of m. But what you will see is that this step that I calculated here, you will no longer be able to calculate. You can't compute the correlation of L half chi to the k with chi bar of m. Okay. So, so this is a nice method, but, but it does not generalize. But there's actually a, a, a pretty much a trivial method which uh, Rudnick and I found, which does generalize. So, so, so let me just say what happens for, say, L half of chi d. So you want to get some lower bound for the kth moment of this. And what you do is you look at uh, you look at the sum over discriminant of L half chi d times uh, some Dirichlet polynomial A of chi d to the to the k minus one. So at least this works when uh, k is a, is a natural number. And And the idea is to take A of chi d to be a, a very short sum. So it's a sum over n going up to some x to a small power, like 1 over 100k maybe, of uh, chi d n over square root n. So the problem with computing moments is that when you want to approximate something like L half or zeta, of zeta to the k or L half to the k, you need to have series which have more and more terms, and you lose control over how to over orthogonality relations. But if you do this, then you're still keeping the seri kind of series that you want to evaluate, uh, having only a small number of terms. So you can compute, so you can compute, uh, you can compute this, and you can also compute the sum of A of chi d to the, to the k. Overall discriminants going up to x. And then you just use Holder's inequality. So, so if you use Holder, then you can prove that one is bounded by uh, the kth moment of L half to the one over k 
times the sum here. Minus one over k. And it turns out that there's no loss in this method. Apart from constants, it actually requires, it actually recovers the right lower bound for, for the kth moment of uh, this. Uh, you can Yeah. How can you tell that that's zero? How can you tell that this is so that's why you need a lower bound for this. Okay. okay? So that's a it's a it's a good point. So uh, the, the fact that I can calculate this already proves to me that these are all not zero. Right? So so this is the one thing that you have in the T aspect is that you know zeta can't be identically zero on the half line, so you never run into this problem that you have to evaluate something at a point. But of course, if I had a modular form and the sign of the functional equation was always negative, then this thing wouldn't make sense. But I would see it in the first step because I would get no lower bound on, on, on the first quantity that I want. Well, I guess maybe so, the question is what information allows you to conclude this? So, so you need to evaluate the, this, uh, this object. And the reason why you might think that you can evaluate this object is that this is something that can be approximated by not too many terms. Okay? And by fiddling with the fact that I have a very small power of x here, the a of chi d to the x is also not taking too many terms up. So it's still something which is, you know, which you can compute by existing technology. Okay, so, so, so the key is to compute this, and then you can also compute something like this, and, and therefore you get a lower bound. Okay. On the other hand, if I started trying to compute just L half chi d to the k, that would take way too many. It would take a, the approximation would be very, very long, and I would have no control over, over it. So. Or orthogonality. So, so the method that uh, Rudnick and I gave actually get, works for all uh, rational values of k. So, and actually, you know, what I've just said is that w the main input is that you need to know. So you need to know the one plus epsilon moment. So, so if you know the one, the one plus epsilon moment of, uh, of some family of L functions, then you know lower bounds for all moments. Okay. And, uh, and it, uh, you can see that if I use Holder, I, I started with the first moment, so this k has to be bigger than one. This was not some, to, in order to get lower bounds. So you can ask what happens if k is between zero and one. This was raised recently by Heath Brown. Uh, but actually, there's a variant of our method which can be used to settle this. And like, two of my students have worked this out. And they obtained the you know, lower bounds of the right order of magnitude. So this is uh, a little bit technically involved because you have to kind of uh, do some version of mollification and also some version of amplification together in order to get this lower bound. Uh, the, the method that we have also, you know, for every rational value, the kind of bound that we have depends on the denominator of the rational number, so it's not a uniform bound that we have. But recently, there's a, another student of mine whom I'm told I'm to pronounce as Rajivi, and, uh, and he, uh, he and I have proved that there's a, there, are, uh, there are uniform lower bounds that we can get. So uniform in K. So, and then this actually also gave bounds when, also works when K is irrational. This is kind of a technical result, but what I like about the proof is that it uses a very funny thing about approximating numbers by Egyptian fractions. So it's, not, it's not the kind of thing that I thought would have been useful here. But okay. Okay. okay, so now let me turn to upper bounds.
そういうそう I've given you one way to see where this power of log appears which is from the asymptotics of this k divisor function over m but let me give you kind of a, a different way which I like uh, of why you should expect this, these kinds of conjectures for moments of uh, zeta and L functions. And this goes back to a beautiful result of Selberg from the 40s. And Selberg proved that if you look at the values of log zeta half plus it, then this is a Gaussian with mean zero. So approximately Gaussian with mean zero and variance half log log t. So he actually wrote it down for the imaginary part of the logarithm, but you can, you can use the same thing to study the real part of the logarithm. And the real part and the imaginary part are independent of each other. They are two independent Gaussians. So I'm thinking of t being something of size capital T. So what does this mean? This means that if you, if you ask for the probability or the measure of values t for which uh, log mod zeta half plus it is bigger than some, say, lambda times square root of log log x, maybe a half, right, the square root of the variance, then that's... Uh, something like 1 over square root of 2 pi, the integral from lambda to infinity, e to the minus x squared over 2 dx. And the result is proved for, you know, for small values of lambda. Okay. So, so let's say fixed values of lambda and t going to infinity. Now, this result, by the way, is completely unconditional. It's a, it's a great result where even if there are zeros off the half line, you can somehow get rid of the small regions where there are zeros away from the half line, and you can still get a, 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 a statistical result. Now, now imagine that you can, uh, you can just extrapolate that result for all values of lambda. Okay, so then you would say that the probability of having uh, log mod zeta being bigger than some number v should be approximately something like e to the minus uh, v squared over log log t. Roughly speaking. Okay. This is not exactly right because uh, I've just approximated this, uh, this integral by its smallest value, which is going to be e to the minus lambda squared over 2. But of course, it's whatever it is. And I'm going to assume that I can do this for any value of v, whatever. Now, if you, if you, if you believe this, then you have an understanding of what the, kth, the 2 kth moment looks like. So you're looking at the moment mod zeta to the 2k. Uh, so what's happening is that there are some places where the zeta function is getting large. So, of course, that will make a big contribution to this moment. But the probability with which that happens is small. So there will be some optimal region where it's as large as you can with, uh, with not too small a probability. And you want to find what that optimum is. So in other words, I can write this as the integral over v going from minus infinity to infinity. The places where zeta has value e to the v, which is e to the 2kv, times the probability of having such a value, which is x plus minus v squared over log log t. Okay. So it's, uh... And now it's a simple problem to optimize this and find out what value of v is going to give you the largest, uh, largest contribution. And uh, if you optimize it, then you see that v has to be chosen to be of size uh, k times log log t. And if you plug in k times log log t, you get uh, x of k squared times log log t, 
which is your, the right power of log that you have, log t to the k squared. And, and this feature actually happens uh, for all families of L functions, although we don't, we don't have an analog of Selberg's theorem in general. So, so here are some conjectures which are due to uh, Keating and Slate first, I think. Is that... Uh, Say, for example, if you look at the distribution of values of log L half chi D, then this should be a Gaussian with mean uh, half log log X and variance log log X. So here's uh, the discriminants are going up to size capital X. So Implicit in this conjecture is the fact that all of these L values, or almost all of them, are not equal to zero. So it's not something that we hope to see actually proved, uh, unlike Selberg's theorem. And if you look at an orthogonal family, say if you take L half of uh, F twisted by chi D, uh, and let's say you look at only the ones for which the sign of the functional equation is positive, then this should be a Gaussian with mean minus half log log x and variance log log x. Okay. And if you, if you use this conjecture and do a similar kind of calculus argument that I just showed you, then you will see why in these families, the asymptotic will be a little bit larger, log x to the k times k plus 1 over 2, and here it's a little bit smaller, k times k minus 1 over 2. And it's reflected in the fact that this mean is different. It's, uh, it's positive in this case. It's skewed in one direction in, in the symplectic case and in the other direction in the orthogonal case. This also is not a conjecture which we expect to be able to prove because it contains in it the conjecture that the rank of an elliptic curve should be you know, 0 or 1 half the time. Okay. In, the, in the even case, you're saying that most of the time these are not 0. What it also means is that if you just look at the raw, raw values of, uh, of L half chi D for quadratic characters, they all tend to be big because this, this mean is, uh, is, is skewed. And if you look at the values of L half of uh, an elliptic curve, say, twisted by quadratic characters, most of those raw values would be small because, again, the mean is, uh, mean is negative. So on the other hand, if you look at values of zeta, then what you see is that values of zeta will be either Usually, 50% of the time, they'll be big, and 50% of the time, they'll be small. But for example, 0% of the time will the, will the zeta function on the half line take values between 1 tenth and 10, let's say, unlike what happens when you're away from the half line. OK, so now to prove these uh, upper bounds, uh, what I basically do is to prove a, a one-sided version of Selberg's theorem. but which is uniform in a big range. So in other words, what I can prove is that, is that the probability with which, uh, so again, this is assuming RH, so the probability of finding zeta of half plus it being bigger than, uh, than, than v is bounded above by something like e to the minus v squared over log log t. For some range, so v goes up to uh, log log t times log 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 t. OK, usually you would think this is a weak result over what, you know, over the kind of uniformity you might exist. You might want to exist, but but if you look at the, the optimal value where these moments are coming from, it's coming from a constant times log log t. So as long as I get something here which goes to infinity, that's actually all that's relevant for the, for the contribution for the kth moment. So if you want to prove the sixth moment of the zeta function, 
All you have to worry about is values of zeta which are of size log t cubed. Nothing else matters. And, but you also need to know something more. You, you can also prove that it shouldn't, uh, for larger values, you need some control. Um, we have some results like this for larger values of v. And similar results for all families of L functions. You have one sided bounds. So, okay, let me try to explain why you get uh, these kinds of conjectures and also why you can try to prove uh, one sided bounds but not necessarily uh, two sided ones. So, for example, for the one sided bound, you can see that it's okay with me if all these values are actually equal to zero. It's still true. The result that I've stated is still true. There are no large values in this case. So, so well, let me say, let me look at, uh, maybe let me look at this case for, for simplicity. So, so, how should I understand this? Let's just write down the logarithm and not worry about any kind of convergence. So, if I, if I do that, then I have a sum over prime powers, p to the k. Uh, just write down the Dirichlet series for the logarithm, and I would get alpha p to the k plus beta p to the k over uh, k times p to the k over t. Of course, this doesn't converge, but okay. So now there are kind of, uh, okay, if k is at least three, then it's a conversion series because it behaves like p to the three halves and four halves and so on. So let's forget about that. Uh, k equals one, of course, is kind of hard, but that looks like a sum of AP over square root of P, I would expect that the APs have signs which are kind of canceling out, and maybe I can prove something on average about that. So, so this is a sum of independent random variables, let's say. That's where the Gaussian is coming from. And the, the this place where you see the distinction between the different types of family is when K equals two, where the sum barely fails to be, to be convergent. So that's a sum of uh, alpha p squared plus beta p squared over two p. Okay, I have to put something about p. Maybe p goes up to x, let's say. Right. And what's the average value of alpha p squared plus beta p squared? Well, alpha p squared plus beta p squared plus one is the coefficients of the symmetric square, which are going to average out to zero. So alpha p squared plus beta p squared averages out to minus one. So this is minus half log log x. And if you did the same kind of heuristic with, uh, uh, with, with quadratic characters, the only difference is that here you will see the character chi, d, chi of p squared, which is always one, so the mean value will be half log log x. Okay, so, so that kind of explains why you should get these different behaviors. So, Now let me explain uh, why you can prove one-sided upper bounds, but not necessarily two-sided ones. Uh, so the idea is, so let's pretend that uh, the zeta function is a polynomial. So, so let's look at C of half plus it, and maybe, so I'll also show you a proof that the Riemann hypothesis implies the Lindelof hypothesis in passing here. So suppose you look at C of half plus it divided by C of you know, minus some three halves plus it or something like that. Which is something I understand. This is just C of uh, phi halves plus it, so it's in, the up, it's in the range of absolute convergence by the functional equation. So if you think of the, of the zeta function as being a polynomial, it's a product over all its roots of uh, one minus uh, half plus it over rho divided by one minus you know, minus three halves plus it over rho. And you can see that the rows will kind of cancel out. And then I'm really picking up the zeros which are close to half plus it. So it's a product over zeros uh, half plus i gamma of something like the absolute value of t minus gamma divided by, uh, from this I get something like two plus i times t minus gamma. 
this thing is convergent. It's, it's not a big deal to, to figure out what, what's going on with this. So, so what you see is that the behavior of uh, the zeta function at half plus it is really governed by the zeros which are close to t. Okay? So, so in other words, if I take logarithms on both sides, I have some function. So let me say I have some function f of uh, x. So let's say I, I put uh, squares on here and then take the square root. And then I have a function here which looks like log of uh, uh, 4 plus x squared over x squared. And then I'm kind of summing this function over all the zeros of f of uh, uh, t minus gamma. And I have to understand something about, about this function. OK? Now, so how much more time do I have? So, five minutes. OK. So, so you can try to understand a sum like this by the explicit formula, which is going to convert this to some problem about primes. So it'll be converted to something about primes. But of course, this function is, uh, is kind of messed up. So the function that you get over primes might be something infinite. Okay. It has to be something bad, because uh, this function has a singularity at x equals 0. It goes to infinity. So of course, this sum here is not so nice. And so the sum on the other side will also be not so nice. But on the other hand, if I want to get some kind of uh, bounds for this, so when x is 0, this is actually infinity. So let's say I want to get a lower bound for this which actually amounts to getting an upper bound for this because I've kind of flipped things around going from here to there. So now, now I have the question, can I get a lower bound for this? I, I write a minor run for, for f. So f is bigger than some nice function g, where I understand something about the Fourier transform of g has some restricted compact support. So this condition that the support of G is, uh, is restricted is going to mean that I get terms in the explicit formula which are not going to be involving too many terms, and I can hope to understand that uh, directly. So, so there, are, you know, there are kind of ad hoc ways in which you can construct this. One is to take some function like function that you have, convolve it with a function which is nice and smooth, whose Fourier transform has compact support. Then you will hope to get some kind of lower bound like this, and on the other side, you will get some function of compact, of, uh, compact support. But uh, it turned out quite nicely that, that there's some nice work by analysts, uh, so here by Carnero and uh, Waller, who've been studying precisely these kinds of problems where uh, the history of this goes back to Bjorling and Selberg, who figured out how to get ex extremal ap approximations major and some minor runs to characteristic functions of intervals, which have been used in number theory before in the large sieve and so on. But uh, Carnero and Waller had a, a generalization of these results of, uh, of, uh, of, of Selberg. And uh, what we, so this is uh, joint with, uh, uh, with Chandi. So what we realized was that this function actually fits precisely into their framework. And so you can, you can actually write down and give, so you can write an optimal such uh, g down. So, so what this allows you to do is that, is that then you can, you can go through this and you can write a, an upper bound for the logarithm of the zeta function, which essentially looks like this. It's an upper bound over the primes going up to some point, say uh, t to the 1 over v, let's say. Uh, this is just what you would imagine if you just write down the, this non-convergent series for the logarithm down. And then you get an error. And the error is uh, going to be smaller based on how large you can take, uh, you know, how small you can take this. So something like log t divided by. Sorry. 
Okay, I'm going to get this. Uh, maybe. This doesn't look right to me, but okay. So, so, so something like this where, let me, let me put it differently. So let me say I go up to x, and then I approximate it by log t over log x. Okay. Up to some constant. So, so in particular, if you approximate it with x going up to uh, log of t squared or something like that, where you can estimate this trivially, you get an upper bound for the zeta function, which looks like log t over log log t, which is the, the Lindelof hypothesis for, for the zeta function. So actually, we've proved in this way that uh, zeta of half plus it is bounded by something like 2 to the log t over 2 log log t. And there's a general bound that you can write down for all L functions. And also, there are numerically very effective bounds on this. So if there are applications that you have, like uh, you know, maybe for finding all numbers represented by ternary quadratic forms, you can plug in now these bounds which have been given by by Chandi for, for such problems. Uh, OK, so maybe to quickly finish the proof of the upper bound, once you have an upper bound of this type, you can try to understand this via moments. You can try to get an estimate for the frequency which with this takes large values. That, in turn, gives you control over the frequency with which zeta takes large values. And then you can prove the upper bound on, uh, on zeta half plus it. So if I have a few minutes more, I can say, uh, a little bit about the third thing that I, that I wrote down, which is uh, bounds for s small values. So there are a number of uh, results. One, which I hope will be written up uh, shortly, is with, uh, uh, with Connery and uh, on the Vanyard. Where we give an example of a sixth moment Where, where we see the constant 42 up here. So the example is over all Dirichlet characters with conductor going up to, up to some size. And you also have to allow a little bit of averaging in the T aspect. So it's kind of a complicated family to write down. But the main thing that we worked hard was to see this uh, constant on that we can now. And also we have some, an example with the eighth moment where we can see 24,024, at least conjecturally. Or we're on the edge of seeing that. And, uh, and then with Matt Young. Uh, on, on, our, on GRH, so these methods seem to give you upper bounds, but there's actually a case where we are on the edge, which is uh, uh, quadratic twists of modular forms. Or if you like, the fourth moment of, uh, or the fourth moment of quadratic Dirichlet L functions. In this case, we are barely not able to compute the asymptotics, but on GRH, we are now able to compute these asymptotics. And then uh, lastly, uh, Radzivi has uh, a nice application where he is, for the first time, able to get upper bounds on the right order of magnitude for some moment of zeta more than the fourth. So he can go up to something like 4.4 and still get upper bounds on the right order of magnitude. In other words, getting rid of this epsilon in this result that I, that I mentioned. So thank you very much.